Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the United States Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, where we're doing a series of interviews on the challenges facing the Navy, the United States, and its allies. And we're uh, talking to a military professor, Captain uh, Fred uh, Turner, Fred Turner the fifth, in fact, which is uh, pretty impressive. You're the only fifth uh, I've ever met who uh, is the Joint Military uh, Operations Military Professor uh, here, an intelligence uh, officer by uh, by background and a, a cyber expert. And I wanted to start off with, um, you know, integrated cyber operations. You know, that is something that you hear over and over again. You hear it in relation to how our potential adversaries are in relation to what we are. Talk to us about what sort of this integrated, what does integrated cyber operations mean for the Navy, uh, whether you're, you know, t talking to somebody at the theoretical level or on a deck plate level, because folks have sometimes, you know, it's a very intimidating field, and folks don't know as much about cyber, cyber operations and what it all means. So let's start at that basic point. You know, what does integrated cyber operations mean? Yeah, so, I mean, to, to start with, when I'm looking at integrated cyber operations, um, I have to overcome some barriers. Um, and this is part of what we're doing here at the Naval War College, which is to try to educate the students in understanding what cyberspace operations are, and then how do I take those and bring them into the mainstream? How do I get it out of this boutique, which is where we are in, in many respects now and have been for years, and make it into the day-to-day -day discussions um, these discussions can be at the strategic level and policy level. Um, we can look at them at the operational level and planning at the fleet, um, at the various combatant commanders, and then all the way down to the tactical level, down to the actual user on the deck plates who needs to understand that every time he or she is actually on a computer, they're operating in cyberspace, and that whatever they do might incur a vulnerability um, that might end up um, causing harm to the, the ship or aircraft or submarine that they're on. So these are the, the, the basic starting points that we look at. And then the idea is that, you know, first of all, there's, there's training, right? So training of the, the workforce and, and, uh, and all the sailors and soldiers and airmen that are associated with the Navy and the Joint Force. And then I have to, to um, go beyond that, though, because just the day-to-day -day training only goes so far. What we need to do is integrate this into people's day-to-day -day thinking. And so that when they walk into a room and they um, say on to a p for operational planning, um, if, they l if they're um, going to normally discuss what are we going to do with the ships, where are we going to, what's the disposition going to be, how are we going to either fight or plan to fight um, uh, in some sort of operation. Well, I need to be able to have the the guy that has normally, or a woman who's normally been associated with driving ships or subs or aircraft, also be thinking in terms of, well, how can I leverage cyberspace? And how can I defend myself from an adversary who is going to come after me via cyberspace as a domain? So that's, that's really my starting point in, in all of this. Um, let me uh, ask you that as from a training, pr and I just want to make clear that these views are your own that you're expressing. You're not speaking yes. for the for the War College proper. Um, but is there, do folks have, each one of the military services have been working to improve cyber education, even from a basic training standpoint. There's now coursework at the Naval Academy to make sure that uh, MIDS get cyber uh, education at least. Uh, universities are setting up a little bit of time so that students have a sense, high schools are looking at it. Are we at a fundamental level, given that we live in this cyber age, uh, we have supercomputers in our pockets, we live in an internet of things uh, where uh, Siri is collecting on us as much as Alexa or, or anybody else is. Um, are we doing as good of a foundational job, even at a very young level, at an elementary school level, to start preparing people to think properly in a cyber age about cyber hygiene, uh, self-defense, because you're trying to applicate that to folks once they put on a uniform and get into service. And most of your time at basic training is about learning how to march and learning how to shoot, but less time actually on something that may actually be more dangerous, which is on the cyber side of thing. Yeah, so yes and no, of course, like any other, um, there's so many other things out there. Um, first of all, when you talk about people before they come into the service, you know, we talk about how educated they are in all the new tools that, that, that operate and allow them to operate in what we would call cyberspace from a military perspective. 
But the reality is most of your youth out there are really only app deep, as people will often say. They understand how to operate their iPhones. They understand how to uh, operate those, the, you know, the, the apps that are on those iPhones um, or any other phone like that. But what they don't really understand is what's going on behind it. Right? So there's a technical component of that that needs to be reinforced at the, early, at the earliest level. But then also there's a more, um, there's a human element to it, right? People will do things, um, say kids will do things via cyber, cyberspace, network, computers, and so on that they would never do in person, right? There's this feeling of anonymity and security, right? Adults do the same thing, right? We trust the banking, we trust what's going on online. People post pictures and figure, no big deal. This for some reason also seems to manifest itself, by the way, at the national level, right? Countries do things right now in cyberspace that they would not necessarily do with physical um, weapons uh, platforms and so on. So there has to be an ed a piece to that early education to somehow make people understand that anything they, that they do in cyberspace uh, ha has potentially the same repercussions um, that you would have as if you were actually doing that. Because when you really think about it, and you think about it in, in terms of cyberspace analogies, that no matter what I'm doing in cyberspace, I'm actually, the, the, there's a, a con commensurate um, activity that I would describe it at in, in the physical world, that I'm actually doing it um, and it's not just virtual. It's not just this 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 thing out there that that didn't really happen. And so that's a big piece of this that I need. We need to get people to understand. Um, and again, it goes up to the national level again that a country like um, uh, Russia can conduct actions in cyberspace, um, turn off electrical power plants. That if you actually did that with a physical weapon, would have probably f far more reaching consequences than when they just do it in cyberspace. It would be cause a spell eye, right? I mean, if, if you bomb somebody's power plant, uh, you are likely to perhaps incur a kinetic <laughs> response. Uh, absolutely. So one of my uh, favorite analogies is I said, look, if I had a, um, a building with a bunch of computer servers in it with a lot of data on it, and someone launched a missile at that, at that building and destroyed it, it is pretty obvious who the president who um, other decision makers would turn to and say, why didn't you defend us, right? It would, they'd look at Department of Defense. A missile came, hit this building, destroyed all these computers. No, nobody died, but it might be considered an act of war. Yet, if somebody goes in via cyberspace, and this, this has happened, and goes in and destroys all the data in a, in a series of computers and then actually makes those computers completely worthless other than as potentially coat racks. <laughs> um, yeah. But, well, you know, paperweights, building yeah, blocks, paperweights. but that's a Sony example, right? I mean, the penetration of Sony and the destruction of, the, of not just that batch of data, but corrupt all the backup data. Yeah, exactly. There's a Sony, there's a Sony example. Uh, there's Saudi Aramco uh, back in 2012. Um, uh, there's uh, an example with the, the more recent Maersk um, compromise. And in, in all cases, you end up having data that's destroyed, gone, computers that are now essentially junk, yet the repercussions from that were certainly not what they would have been if it had been done in an overt physical way with people, weapons, platforms, and so on. So it's something that, we're, that, that I think all countries are struggling with right now. Nobody understands the red lines um, and what people can cross. And so right now what we're doing, we, the U.S., the West, and frankly the rest of the world, are backing into this. There's, the, the, there's discussion yet no agreement on what's acceptable and what's unacceptable behavior in cyberspace. And uh, in, in those instances, right, North Korea accused in the Sony breach, the Iranians in the Aramco, and who was the culprit in the Danish uh, breach, the uh, Maersk one? It looked like criminals. Um, there are some that theorize Russians, some that theorize Chinese, um, but that it was, it was criminal activity. So probably not overtly directed at Maersk, but showed you the potential for what could happen uh, with a program that, that went beyond what it was supposed to do. Um, 
So let's go back to cyber operations and the integration of it. Yeah. So what are the keys and the tricks to integrating cyber operations successfully on, on our part? What are some of the things that need to happen? Because you used to work with Admiral McCullough, who was the first uh, Tenth Fleet Commander, the Cyber Fleet Commander, uh, and and certainly you know a, a brilliant thinker in in his in his own right. And you've also worked with Admiral Rogers, uh, who uh, was until recently director of the National Security Agency and and also the U.S. Cyber Command Commander. So talk to us a little bit about what that integrated cyber operations model looks like and how the Navy model integrates into sort of a, a, a DOD-wide cyber model and then how that DOD cyber model integrates then into a whole U.S. government ecosystem because all of these pipes ultimately are all co-linked. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, the first thing I have to do um, is to what I, what I always would say would be to demystify what this is all about because to integrate it, I need to be able to discuss it. And there... You know, so if you think about this, networks and cyberspace grew up with people um, created their own language essentially, right? So when you talk to you know when you talk to your network technician about your computer, and if they get really going on the subject, at some point, at least certainly for me, because I was not I don't have a technical background, um, at some point I would get lost until someone could tell me how to translate it. So to me, first and foremost. I've got to figure out how to translate this into language we all understand. And because, as I said earlier, every action in cyberspace is analogous to something in physical space. I think that's possible to do, right? And we've tried to do that, and, and I say we, the Department of Defense has tried to do that um, in joint doctrine to start with, right? Applying joint doctrine and concepts to cyberspace to come up with a common language to, 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 to work from. Um, then part of it, again, I, talk, I mentioned the education, so I need to educate, you know, you were talking about earlier educating the, the younger folks. I still have to educate all the older people as well, people like me, people the, that are older than us who have, are very comfortable in, in what they've done for the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Okay, so that's, that's another piece. That lays the foundation, and that's one of the things we're trying to do here at the, at the Naval War College, which is try to educate all the students who come through here to, to better understand this. Then you have to then, um, as part of that education, teach the, the, the students here, as well as elsewhere within DOD, how to integrate that into the planning that they already know how to do. So at the operational level, I need to have them uh, treat cyberspace, again, like the other warfare domains, and then um, have that discussion in the open during the regular planning groups and not as an aside. Too often in the past, sometimes because of security um, issues, um, the, the planning goes on and goes on and goes on, and then here come the cyber people, and they say, look, here's something that I think you can use in your plan. Well, it's too late, right? You need to do this from the beginning. So that's one of the things that, that we're working on. That's at the fleet level. Same thing at the combatant command level. So when I get up into, into that joint, joint level. And then I need to understand the art of the possible, right? I need to understand what I need to do defensively. I need to understand what I can do on the offensive side. And, and again, bring those, bring those into the planning. And then once I understand that, and this is a, another discussion, I, I need to be able to bring that up to the most senior levels because right now authorities are held at the most senior levels, right? The president uh, essentially holds all the, the, the final authorities for, for any sort of significant offensive action, for example, in cyberspace. But to do all that, I keep coming back around to, I need to make decision makers comfortable with what's gonna happen in cyberspace. And because they are going to be naturally conservative because, they, because if you don't know what, what's going to happen or you don't understand what's gonna happen to you or to the adversary, you're likely to not take action and not utilize the vast potential of cyberspace. And, and last question, from an organizational standpoint, um, how does the organizational construct have to change? Uh, we've seen changes, for example, in the Marine Corps to put a technology officer that would be in charge of cyber. Uh, Army has looked at that and cyber conjoined with uh, electronic warfare, I, I think, is uh, an element that also the Army was looking at. Um, and obviously by policy, they're, they're now co-connected. Uh, you know, I remember Rooster Schmidl making, uh, you know, discussing that some time ago. Um, talk to us about what the organizational changes have to be, um, or, or, you know, do our, our organizational changes necessary from your standpoint, and if so, what do they need to look like? 
Well, so that, of course, is a, a great question because we've been struggling with this from the um, for, for years. Right? So certainly, when I showed up at Fleet Cyber in 2011, um, the discussion was already well underway and had been underway for a while. Um, Two, two opposite ends here, right? There's a centralizer, I'd say the centralizer people uh, theory, you know, theory where you need to have one commander control all the cyber forces. And I think that's essentially the prevailing thought certainly from um, you know, US Cyber Command um, uh, viewpoint. Um, the other end of that, of course, is that, that we fight as a d in, within the Department of Defense as combatant commanders and it's geographically based. And each com combatant commander wants to actually control the forces he or she c owns. Um, and so these two, these two sides of the, of the coin are, are really where the basis of that discussion is. Um, I, I think we'll end up, and I think this is where we're going, slowly we're evolving into something that would say something like a SOCOM or a STRATCOM model, right? Where US Cyber Command remains um, the, the central authority, the um, uh, r probably retains, say, at least you know, retains OPCON uh, operational control over those cyber forces. Um, yet, um, at some point, they're going to have to trust and potentially uh, allow more control, even at least at the tactical level, maybe take on, maybe occasional operational control. So some evolution that allows the, 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 the actual commanders fighting whatever war, conflict, engagement, to, to have more authority to actually um, uh, execute uh, offensively and to maybe do more defensively, right? Um, we're still trying to corral. Defensive is a little easier for people to, to understand uh, or understand or allow um, actions to take place because it tends to take place within our own blue space. Um, on the offensive side, that gets a little, uh, a little trickier. But I think that's what we have to do. Eventually, you're going to have to devolve uh, organizationally. It, it's, it, maybe it's less organizationally, but more authorities-wise to devolve those authorities from the more senior level, centrally controlled, out to the forces actually fighting. Um, to, again, to really realize the full potential of your cyberspace forces. Now, one, one brief uh, uh, follow-on to that. Um, from a cyber, from an offensive standpoint, that's true that the capability resides with the president, but mm -hmm. you also need offensive capability from a defensive posture as well. Mm -hmm. And then the question is pursuit and how far out of those lines do you go? Do those authorities fundamentally need to change at the speed of cyber so that in the event of an incursion, when it comes to pursuit insofar as folks can visualize that, do those lines have to be a lot more fluid ultimately and have more devolution of authority than we currently have? Yeah, a absolutely. They, they will have to devolve, right? So right now, the, the discussion we typically have when people say, well, we don't have the authority, so we shouldn't uh, really look seriously at, at the options in cyberspace. My counter argument to that is the authorities will come when, when they're needed. Now, that's an easy thing to say as well. So I think that we need to get ahead of that, right? We don't want to have to, at the last minute, decide, uh, suddenly be given authorities. So yes, they, they need to devolve, particularly in the response, because what you're describing is um, defensive cyber operations response actions, where I can't, you know, I can't just sit there and defend, defend, defend all the time. Um, defend, defend, defend is a losing proposition. Um, you can't um, actually defend anything or everything all the time. So you will have to devolve those authorities down. And certainly in a high-end conflict, that's even more obvious, right? That if you get into a high-end conflict, tactical commanders are gonna have to have authorities, operational commanders are gonna have to have authorities to actually execute cyber operations and be able to respond at the, at the speed of cyberspace. Captain Fred Turner, uh, military professor here in Joint Military Operations. Sir, thanks very, very much. Thank and uh, fair winds following season on whatever you do next after the college. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Enjoyed it very much.